fiscal concerns and manage our spending with our, with our uh, taxes. And I'm, I'm sensitive to that. And yet, I do see behind that, and this is something as, as a Democrat I think is very important. I think that that conversation around budget deficits ultimately is really about cutting. And it's cutting things like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And I think I have to say that the Democrats have let that conversation go on, I think, too long. I think when people are talking about cutting Medicare and Social Security and Medicaid, they're talking about taking money away from those who are most vulnerable and those who are most needed. Now, people who get their Social Security checks, what do they do with it? Are those, those individuals getting wealthy from those, from, from those kind of uh, uh, resources? No, they're not. In fact, what we know about Social Security is that currently, the elderly who are supported by Social Security, 9% of them are, are in poverty level, at the poverty level, 9%. Now, if you take away Social Security, that number goes to 40%. So these individuals are relying on Social Security as their basic um, funding, the basic way of supporting themselves. And these are individuals who take their, those resources that they get, that they've earned over time and paying into the system, and they do what with them? They don't put it in a bank account somewhere. They bring it out to restaurants like this, to stores like the ones across the street. In other words, they spend that money. That money goes in turn to support jobs, it goes in turn to support tax revenues, to pay for services that we all use. Now we're talking about our governments looking to cut, cut those supports from those individuals. Is that going to make it harder for them? Is that going to stimulate this economy? I don't think it will. And I believe we have a responsibility to those individuals who have put in, who have paid and earned those benefits, and we need, we need to protect them and sustain those efforts. So, for my candidacy, that is, not, that is not a discussion that I'm going to be uh, excited about you know, when people start talking about making the cuts, when we know what they're talking about is really cutting Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare. Those are the most vulnerable individuals in our society. We need to find other ways to grow our economy, stoke our economy, to, to offer jobs, but not taking away from those who are the most needed. So um, I would like to uh, you know, open it up to questions. We'd like to hear what you all, what, what concerns you all have. And Gretchen, if that's okay, could you yeah. have, could, can we hear okay. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna just move over here so I can be a little, I can hear you a little bit better, just be a little closer to you. Does anyone? I'm quite sure the kids seen what happened on the movie John Q. You know, he had health care, and then his, his son had health care, and then it was a condition that wasn't covered by his insurance. So we all in agreement that we do need to have health care, and we do need to have it where it can cover, you know, pre-existing conditions and everything else. So I'm, I'm totally on you on that, uh, about the health care. And then, too, you said you, you come from Europe, where there is what universal health health care? Yeah. yeah. Socialized medicine. Right. See, and I lived in Europe, so I know how important that is. You know, how you taking care of the people. You know, and I I, I, I do totally agree hundred percent that we do need that. Well, and I know in our country, especially in some democratic circles, the a single payer option is very much discussed and in, in, in favor of, you know, I, from my standpoint, I mean, I support uh, a market-based, you know, healthcare exchange mm -hmm. like the one that's that right. we're trying to implement. Right. Right. So I believe that we ought to have some free market options that do really that offers a great deal of uh, flexibility and choice. So I, I'm certainly, you know, uh, like to get more information about the single payer option, but I, I'm, I'm uh, I, I believe that, you know, trying to tweak the system that we currently have and still offer uh, as I said, sort of private insurance is, is what, what can benefit, keep costs down, hopefully the most, and offer the kind of uh, choice that, that, that our, our citizens need and want. Uh, can you talk yes. more about uh, gridlock? It's, um, you know, the way I, I see it, um, the Republican Party becoming more and more entrenched, more and more base-oriented, you know, and that's how the House is. Houses now today. Um, I'm 60 years old, and the Republicans that I remember years ago are, are, are unthinkable in the Republican Party today. It's, it's, um, in the standard 
that I saw when I was younger, it's a radicalized party. And I, 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 don't, I don't know how, uh, I have no idea how, how you bridge that gap. And, and apparently, um, neither does Congress, because, uh, but, you know, when you, when, you, when you know, you speak about finding a center and finding a common ground, how do you go about doing that? Well, you know, that's a good question. Yeah. So how do you find common ground? I, mean, I think one of the things that you need, we need to identify what is the common ground. And something like when we talk about health, for instance, yeah. I think we can all agree that health is important. Yeah. And we all value health and health care. Okay. So how do, we, how do we bring that about? How do we improve access? How do we make it affordable? Yeah. I think, you know, I think we, can, we can identify those areas. But I do think what we do need is we do need to change some of the players that are growing up in Washington who, have, who don't have that same kind of cynical perspective that this is just the way it's always been and we just need to keep doing it this way. I think we do need folks who are the unusual suspects, if you will. Individuals who are ready to serve who have, I think it's an advantage that I haven't served because it gives me an open mind and a fresh perspective on these problems, and a willingness to serve, because really, whether you're, uh, when, when you're elected as a United States Senator, you're serving not just Republicans, not just Democrats, you're serving everyone. Yeah. And I think everyone benefits from, from some of these core values. And so I think having that perspective, and as I talked about earlier, really having my, the medical training that I've had, really it has prepared me to look at things more objectively and to be willing to consider other alternatives and other options and, and, and work in the true spirit of bipartisanship. I think you're right, things have changed, and I think the only way they're going to change for the better is if we have individuals who are willing to uh, you know, talk about you know, discussions, looking to seek common ground, and really and talk in the spirit of bipartisanship. So that's, I think we do that one individual at a time, one legislator at a time. And who's going to offer the, that opportunity the best is I think what the voters need to decide. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Um, Georgia has an history of and it has led a lot. How, if you are the and chosen as our candidate and elected to the Senate, how do you lead um, in the Senate and bring Georgia back to the forefront of how we speak? You know, we have Davis at the Santa Line and Cleveland and Mr. Russell. How would you be that quintessential uh, leader in the Senate? Well, when you say how Georgia used to be, can you give me a, can you be a little more specific? You know, like, well, we have Senator by Rick Russell who were having, you know, I just thought the powerful position, but I actually have influence. How do you work to influence legislation and present it? Yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's a good question. Some of those are kind of technical questions that I, I don't know the answer until you're actually in that position. But I would say that, you know, from my standpoint, you know, one of the things, as I mentioned before, that, uh, my standing on issues, I think people are going to be clear about. And I'm going to be tra as transparent as I can be and, and as accountable as I can be around that. As I mentioned before, around the health care, I've, I've already started to, to um, uh, uh, work to provide information to Georgia residents around, around the state, in Atlanta and also in Macon, where we set up our town hall meetings. So I'm not waiting until election day to start leading. I believe that there's an urgency, there's a need now, and as a candidate, I'm ready to do those things. I'm ready to demonstrate to people my leadership, my willingness to step out because I feel this sense of urgency. So I think that's the same kind of urgency, it's the same sort of approach that I'm going to take up in Washington. That, you know, I don't need, you know, I may be a junior senator, maybe a, a, you know, a freshman as far as a first political office, but I know what's right. I know how to help people. I know what people need. And I'm going to be working hard to make sure that those needs get met. Regardless of my uh, tenure. Did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. Or are you just wiping your mouth? <laughs> I was just wiping my mouth, but since you wanted that, <laughs> okay. would you agree with Elizabeth Warren that students ought to get the same loan interest rates as big banks? Okay. Well, I don't know exactly um, uh, the kind of rates the big banks are getting. 0.5% um, around that range. A lot less than the, what do you get as a student? 15? 10. 10. Much higher, much higher. Well, you know, I, I, what I'll say is, that, well, this is, I appreciate you mentioning that, because, and this is the first I've heard of that kind of comparison. Uh, I'm certainly in favor of making uh, education more affordable for students and, look, and lessening the burden that they have in order to invest in their future. So I think that is a key area. 
what percentages, I'm not, I'm not prepared to answer that question, but I, I do think that's a valid point with respect to the burden that's being placed on young people and their families in order to get educated and have the opportunities they need, uh, the skills that they need in order to be successful vocationally and pursue the path of their dream. So I would be very interested in looking at that information and just making sure that we are offering uh, really as making those loans as affordable as we can. And I'm not convinced that they are, that they, I'm, I believe that there's opportunity to, to lower those uh, uh, lending costs, borrowing costs, I'm sorry. Yes, Taylor. One of my concerns is the natural resources of Georgia. And uh, even back, I support our president, but when he came in in 2008, one thing he did was lift the ban on offshore drilling that could have impacted Georgia right before the deep well, the, anyway, the awful thing in the Gulf. And he changed on that, thank heavens. And we've also seen concerns with like Plant Vogel uh, in Augusta and uh, with two more nuclear uh, reactors going up. And one thing that has recently happened is we've learned there's a Fortune 500 company called Spectra Energy that is going to be plowing through eight counties, I think it is, of South Georgia, going down from Alabama, Darty County around uh, Albany, through Colquitt County and Moultrie and uh, Lowndes and Tift. And this is one concern I didn't know if you were aware about aware of it. It is a natural gas pipeline that's unique because it's a 36-inch high-pressure transmission pipeline meant to transmit the natural gas to South Florida at a rate of a billion cubic feet a day, and it has a potential explosion zone of a thousand feet on either side of it. And right now, it's slated to go within half a mile of the hospital in Moultrie. And citizens are not aware of, of this hardly at all, except for landowners who are getting notices of imminent domain and that they will be paid peanuts for a 100-foot easement on their property. So I, was, I had two questions, really, <laughs> get off my my soapbox. Number one is anybody in Atlanta or were you aware of this pipeline? And number two, do you have an environmental platform at all? How do you feel about all this? Well, the short answer to your first question is that no, I certainly wasn't aware of it. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that to my attention. And as far as the environmental platform goes, we're in the process of developing that. One of my concerns is climate control. And so one of the things that we'll be looking at closely is how can we be involved in sort of regulating uh, emissions um, and, and in a way that will minimize the gas house effect and uh, run the risk of you know, continuing you know, global warming, which I do, which I do believe it, which has been uh, supported by, by you know, a number of scientists you know, internationally. So I am concerned about that. Uh, I am concerned about the environment. One of the areas that you know, currently is under discussion in here in the state of Georgia, and it's important to the state of Georgia, is this uh, deepening of the Savannah Harbor, which I, which I do support. Uh, and I believe that's a bipartisan effort to bring a lot of jobs and uh, economy to, to the state. At the same time, there are environmental concerns uh, about that process and what the effect that that's going to have on that, on that uh, 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 area in South Georgia. And I believe that those, we need to, we need to pay attention to those concerns, and we need to see if, they, if, if our environment is going to be impacted. What are what are steps that we can take to minimize the effect of, you know, a, a move such as deepening the port, which I think would benefit our our state, and, and we ought to be looking at opportunities like that. And yet at the same time, uh, we need to make sure that the, the those other concerns are also taken into account. And that there is a plan, uh, a reason plan to address those concerns. Have you developed a position regarding federal? Um, <coughs> Guarantee, a guaranteed federal, uh, would you put it, loans for construction of nuclear power plants? The short answer is no. I haven't developed a position. And if you have some strong feelings about it and you want to steer me to, to, to some information about it, I'm glad I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. <laughs> I'm all ears. So there's still parts of my platform that haven't been. There's some that are more developed than others. 
Uh, and and I'm, I'm certainly open to, to hearing points of view and, and from form, folks who are informed and, uh, and who, can, who can provide some useful information. Thank you very much, Dr. Ray. Let me just, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, if I could, you know, just ask you all to consider a couple of things. If there's anything that you heard, or if there's more than one thing that you heard that you liked about uh, my stance, my policy uh, decisions, and, 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 and uh, work in the community so far, uh, I'd ask you to consider volunteering and, and your, some of your time to help the campaign. Uh, you can do that at drive4senate.com, or you can talk to me tonight. And uh, I'd appreciate any of those who, again, sort of, uh, and felt that what I had to say was compelling and that I'm a candidate that you might support. I'd certainly appreciate some uh, a donation or contribution to the campaign. With the with the with our modern technology, I can take contributions and put the credit card right here tonight. So please keep that in mind as, as you're thinking about this evening. But thank you very much for your time this evening. Enjoyed uh, being with you and be glad to stay here and answer some additional. Oh yeah, questions. we'll we'll be around, so not a problem. <laughs> <laughs>